Starship has roared once again, this time with all six of its Raptor engines, and Blue Origin has suffered a historic abort. This is tomorrow's Space News. Let's start with the exciting part, fire! For the first time ever, Starship 24 has conducted a six engine static fire with all three sea level raptors and all three vacuum raptors igniting for about five ish seconds. The test, at least from the outside, looked like it went off without any major issues, which is a step in the right direction for the program. There might have been just a bit too much fire though, as grass fires soon started near the suborbital pad where S24 currently resides. There was a lot of backlash on Twitter and other public forums because of this, but grass fires after engine firings aren't new and they aren't uncommon. This has happened several times before at various launch sites all over the world, and fire tends to be the outcome of dry grass and hot exhausts. Shortly after the static fire, once the sun had set and the vehicle had been saved, firefighters headed down the highway towards the blaze, starting controlled burns to help control the fire. This shot from Nick Answeeney shows a bit of the aftermath of the fire. Want some booster news? Here's some booster news. This new common dome has been flipped, allowing us to see inside, and what we can see is the new elliptical dome design. This common dome is likely to be used inside B10. B7.1, the test tank, has been getting frosty once again. As you can see by the straps down the side, it's in the can crusher, so it could have been tested, but we have had no official confirmation. The cap was disconnected the following day, however, and the day after that, it was rolled to the production site. After that, B7.1 itself was removed from the test stand. If you're a long-time watcher of the news, then you may remember what feels like a very long time ago now. I reported on SpaceX's purchase of Macy's Gun Range, a range just down the road from Boca Chica and what is now Starbase. It is no longer a gun range and it is used for storage and SpaceX has sent down two large nitrogen tanks on a couple of SPMTs on Tuesday. There's been some speculation running around that a full stack of S24 and Booster 7 could be coming soon. However, we then received word via Boca Chica Gal on Twitter that an overpressure notice has been issued for today, Monday the 12th, from 8am to 8pm local time. So, no stack, but possibly more fire from under B7 a little bit later. September 3rd, 2021 saw the inaugural flight of Firefly's Alpha rocket and the first launch for the company. This test flight was aiming for orbit, but it did fall quite significantly short. The team at Firefly took in all the data they gathered during this first attempt, which lasted until just after the vehicle went supersonic, went away for a year and returned yesterday, September 11th, with an attempt of Flight 2 named To The Black. Sadly though, following an early abort and two pushes to the T0 time, the launch was scrubbed for the day due to a drop in the helium pressure. The next launch attempt is tonight, starting at 2200 UTC, and you can see the broadcast over on Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronauts channel. Still though, we can talk about the payloads. The Teachers in Space program has a CubeSat called Serenity, which aims to provide educational resources to not only teachers, but students around the globe. NASA also has an educational payload on board called TechEd Sat 15. It's a three unit CubeSat and it's a cooperation between NASA and San Jose State University. On board is a deployable exoatmospheric brake, which is pretty nifty, and the TechEd Sat program, similar to the Teachers in Space program, aims to assist college and university students in getting experience with satellite construction and operation. The Libra Space Foundation from Greece technically has three of their items on board, with their Pico bus and the Pocket Cubes Cubic 1 and Cubic 2, both spelt with a Q for some reason. Pocket Cubes are relatively new and their form factors are essentially a halved CubeSat. One CubeSat unit, or 1U, is 10cm cubed, whilst one Pocket Cube unit, or 1P, is a 5cm cubed. Pico bus is designed to carry eight Pocket Cubes and then deploy them once in orbit. The Libra Space Foundation will be focusing on the launch and early operations phase for this flight, conducting amateur radio communications with their two test satellites. 
Those aren't the only pocket cubes flying, however, as two more organizations will be joining the Libra Space Foundation inside the Pico bus. The first is AMSAT EA, an amateur radio organization non-profit from Spain, who have built two pocket cubes called Genesis G and Genesis J. These are upgraded versions of the Genesis L and Genesis N satellites, which were lost during Alpha's first flight, and they were built with help from students at the European University of Madrid. And finally, the last payload is another pocket cube from Fossa Systems, a company which is also based on the Iberian Peninsula in Spain. The satellite is called FOSSASAT 1B and it's a development on FOSSASAT 1, which launched on Rocket Lab's Running Out of Fingers mission. The footage you've just been looking at was a live stream done by the Libra Space Foundation back in 2020 for the integration of the first Alpha flight, which I think is a pretty cool way to connect with the community. Now, time to talk SLS again. I said last week that October would be the only realistic window for SLS, but I may have actually been a bit incorrect on that one. NASA has been repairing the rocket at the pad, sorting out the hydrogen leaks. They're not finished yet, but they are making progress. The biggest issue, though, lies with the Eastern Range, who control who is allowed to launch. If you were not in the know, you could assume that NASA controls the range, but that's not the case. It's the Space Force, formerly the Air Force. NASA have gone to the Space Force and requested two launch dates, September 23rd and 27th, as well as a waiver allowing the limit on the flight termination batteries to be extended from 25 days to 50 days. With no waiver, SLS will have to roll back to the VAB before the next launch attempt, which is where I made the assumption that SLS would not be able to make the remaining September window. That assumption was also made from a shuttle era precedent, with a great example being shared on Twitter later on by former shuttle program manager and flight director Wayne Hale. He said, In my time I went hat in hand to the Eastern Range to ask them to change a rule in our favour several times. Let's just say my batting average was rather low. If NASA can get the hydrogen leaks fixed in the ideal time frame they want, then the tanking test could possibly happen September 17th, but be aware that it could slip. I want to see SLS launch as soon as possible, but I also think that September may not be the most likely launch candidate. We'll still have to wait and see though, and I hope that this new information has cleared up last week's assumption. I quickly have some breaking news to bring you today, as just before the recording of this episode, Blue Origin's NS-23 cargo mission suffered from an in-flight abort. I believe I am correct in saying that this is the first use of an in-flight abort system in the US on a flight which wasn't a test of an in-flight abort system. The closest prior to NS-23 was Mercury Redstone 1, which did ignite the abort tower, but it wasn't due to a failure in the rocket. It was because a circuit shorted and the escape tower decided it no longer wanted to serve on the mission and left the capsule behind. At the time of writing, which is just after the orbit occurred, no official word has been given by Blue Origin of the cause. What we can work out from the live stream coverage is that just after hitting max Q, when the aerodynamic loads are at their greatest on the vehicle, New Shepard 4's BE3 engine flamed out, the booster veered to the left before the capsule ignited the abort motor and separated. Sadly, the public feeds didn't want to show a failing rocket, so they cut to the capsule instead. It is hopefully reassuring to future passengers though, it has verified that Blue is running a good abort system. Blue Origin claimed to have landed the first rocket and it may be contested by SpaceX and even the DCX, but nobody can contest that they have become the first American aerospace organization to use a launch escape system during a normal flight. We've been told to keep an eye out on Blue Origin's Twitter page for more information, which we will be doing, but for now let's look at some more slightly successful launches. It's space traffic time and it's a week full of Earth departures. First up, Senti Space 1, S3 and S4 launched on this Kuaizhou 1A rocket from the Zhiguan Satellite Launch Center in China at 0224 UTC on September 6th. The satellites are commercial small satellites from the company Future Navigation, which will provide satellite navigation services from low Earth orbit. If this test is successful, Future Navigation wants to put 160 satellites into orbit for a navigation constellation. Later on the same day, at 0419 UTC, China was taking to the skies once again with the launch of their Long March 2D from LC3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. 
On board was the Algan 35 Group 05, a group of three reconnaissance satellites. It's reported that these are used for science experiments, land surveying and disaster monitoring, but it is also heavily speculated that they're used for Chinese defence purposes as well. September 7th at 2145 UTC saw a return to the rumble in the jungle as UTELSAT Connect VHTS was launched atop this Ariane 5 from ELA-3 at the Guiana Space Centre in Kourou, French Guiana. The 6.4 metric ton satellite was successfully delivered to its 250 by 60,351 kilometer geostationary transfer orbit where it will provide high speed internet over the more remote regions of Europe. It wouldn't be a space traffic without a Starlink launch and this week again doesn't disappoint with Group 42 launching at 0120 UTC on September 11th from LC-39A at the Kennedy Space Center. The flight was also a bit of a record breaker which I'll get onto in a second. Inside the payload fairing was 34 Starlinks alongside Blue Walker 3, a rideshare payload from AST Space Mobile. Blue Walker 3 was placed into its orbit after two burns by the second stage and following another two burns, the Starlink satellites were placed into their initial orbit 334 by 324 kilometers. A fifth burn followed, deorbiting the second stage, marking a new record for the Falcon 9, relighting five times, breaking the previous record, which was four times. The first stage was also breaking records on Sunday, becoming the first orbital class booster to launch and land 14 times. B-1058 first flew on the Demo-2 mission, carrying Bob and Doug to the ISS. Another non-SpaceX related fact for my Commonwealth friends, but this launch marked the first which occurred during the reign of King Charles III. For comparison, every single launch ever that made it to orbit occurred during the reign of the previous monarch, Queen Elizabeth II. Personally, I wonder with the increase in the commercialization of the aerospace sector, whether the number of launches will rapidly increase during Charles's reign, but only time will tell. Coming up over the next week, we'll be seeing the aforementioned second flight of Alpha, China launching along March 7A, Starlink Group 4 Mission 34 from the Cape, the Owl spreads its wings on an electron from Mahia, and potentially another Starlink flight early on Monday morning, Universal Time. Thank you to the citizens of tomorrow who financially contribute to the show. If you want to see scripts as they're being written, exclusive Discord channels and our extended member live shows, head to join.tmro.tv or the join button below to join the ground support suborbital orbital and escape velocity citizens as well as Neurostream today for as little as 99 US cents a month. For those of you who are new around here, we don't just do a weekly show like a lot of other channels out there, we have more things to bring you throughout the week. For example, on Wednesday, hopefully Dr. Tamitha Scove will be able to bring you the latest in the world of space weather. On Friday, we'll be returning with a live show and I'll be back next Monday with more SpaceX news and hopefully some more developments on the Artemis 1 timeline. But for now, thank you for watching and goodbye.